In this video, we're going to take a deep dive into the top five. I tried to make it five, but it's a little bit more kind of uh, breakthroughs of 2023. By the end, you'll understand both why these are so important, the technical details about each breakthrough, and what you can take away from some of the ideas I talk about to implement in your own projects, careers, and research. So uh, for this is obviously for entertainment purposes. You can totally feel free to disagree. Simply just a weighted average of all my observations throughout the year. Um, and this is all public research. So I don't have access to the secret stuff OpenAI does under the hood. I don't have access to what Google does. This is mostly just papers on Archive and just the internet that are just out there. You can look at them. All links will be in the description. So I think it's best to start off with criteria. So how did I get to all these conclusions? And you said there's five, but I actually have four categories that I decided to sort of split the five pie fairly. So the first one is algorithms. And I actually dedicated two for this because uh, algorithms is more about computational efficiency, maximizing you know memory usage, uh, hardware, etc. Algorithms are the best tool to help maximize your compute efficiency and just do more computation altogether. They make GPT-4 faster than if it would be without you know some little hacks, meaning algorithms. So that's why algorithms are super important, and I put two in that category. Next one is agents. So agents are super cool, and what I mean by this is just sort of in a reinforcement learning environment. So things like Minecraft in a 3D space, uh, perhaps in a video game, right? Where they're sort of learning how to interact with this complex set of rules around them. That's all in this, this space with the defined you know, set of physics. And they have to figure it out on their own. These are super cool as they're going to help us with a lot in the future. This is a very long-term thing. So agents are great. And I have, uh, I have one breakthrough that complements another in the agents category. Next up is quantization. So if you haven't heard of this term yet, quantization is the idea of making some larger thing and compressing it into a smaller one. So if I have, for example, a 16-bit floating point number, that means it occupies uh, 16 bits, uh, 16 on and off switches. What if I want to compress it into eight or maybe four, right? That's what quantization does. And there's other little techniques you can leverage to help uh, increase the amount of or, or decrease the size of uh, the data you're dealing with. Uh, so quantization is pretty cool. It allows you to uh, access and play with models that are much larger if they were to be in sort of like normal data size, if you will. Uh, but quantization is super useful. And last but not least, alignment slash mechanistic interpretability. I know that last one was a little bit of a mouthful, but mechanistic interpretability uh, refers to actually looking into a neural network and seeing uh, which neurons caused it to say this. So if you're talking to an unaligned language model and it says, kill all humans this way, <laughs> uh, and it's not supposed to say that, then you can actually use uh, interpretability tools or mechanistic interpretability to look into the network and see, you know, this is the probability that this sort of thing was picked. And then we can go back and look at which neurons had the most effect on those things being picked, those specific tokens. So that's how you understand sort of how's go what's going on inside the network, trying to remove the black box approach and fully understand what's going on. This is super important for AI safety, but I'll dig more in into that uh, throughout the video. And lastly, before I begin, you might want to consider subscribing. I make this stuff for free. Uh, it's totally free to, free to subscribe and like the video. You can unsubscribe at any time. Uh, this is supposed to build intuition for people, right? So if you enjoy this and you feel like you're learning something from these, you might want them to appear more and you're recommended when I post more videos. So to begin, uh, I'll talk about algorithms and why they're actually the most useful ones. And before I actually go into what the specific breakthroughs were, I think it's important to highlight that uh, a lot of people, some encounter my videos, some are just out there, but a lot of people don't actually understand what a breakthrough is. So a breakthrough doesn't really have to be a revolutionary idea. It doesn't have to be reinventing the wheel. You don't, you're, you don't have to be Nikola Tesla to come up with a, a breakthrough level algorithm. A lot of the time, it's actually using an idea from over here and just seeing, oh, that might actually work really well in machine learning or other way around. And just having that intuition for understanding how the algorithm works under the hood and then seeing how you can apply it to another subfield in computer science is really important. And so 
Actually, both of the algorithms I mentioned here come from this concept. They're not revolutionary level algorithms, like they're not blowing the world away through some just super smart human being. It's, it's just, well, obviously these are super smart human beings, they're researchers, but the main point here is that these are not super original. These have been brought up before, and now they're just being applied in machine learning, and they work really, really well. So I'm going to start off with the first algorithmic breakthrough called Mamba. So Mamba has been gaining popularity in the past few months. It's quite a recent research paper, actually. But to sort of understand what Mamba is, I think it's good to help illustrate sort of how this works on an algorithmic level. So normally attention you get this you get this matrix you have a key vector and a value vector or a key and a query vector and you transpose the key vector and you do a dot product matrix multiply and then you scale it by a value later but i'm not going to go into that now i have a course up on free code camp if you'd like to understand how attention works on a low level but the whole idea here is that it uses a grid so let me just use the whiteboard to help illustrate this. So you can think of attention as, say we have tokens, you know, A, B, C, and D. So in order for this to work, A has to attend to B, A has to attend to C, and D. Same thing with B. B has to attend to A, C, and D, and then C has to attend to A, B, and D, and then D has to attend to A, B, C. So you actually get quite a lot of comparisons going on here, or multiplies, and this actually adds up. So if we were to say do this right here, let's see how many multiplies we would actually have to do in order to get all of the sort of uh, amount of attention for each token. How much does each one attend to the other? That's the idea. So you go um, A attends to B, C and D, so that's three. B attends to A, C and D, three. C attends to A, B and D, another three. And then one, two, three, another three. So this is equal to 12. And we'll see that if we actually add another, if we go A, B, C, D, E, you have to go four. And then another four for B has to attend to these four. C has to attend to one, two, three, four. D has to attend to one, three, 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 four, etc. So each one has to attend to four others. So you end up getting this value 16. And you can see that this actually increases. And there, there's a way to sort of talk about or measure what's called the time or memory complexity of an algorithm. So I guess an easier or more simple way of thinking about this, I know this is quite a mouthful right now, um, the other ones should be fairly easier to understand. Um, but for example, if you were to have like a for loop, do some stuff, and then you have a for loop embedded inside of that, well, for each iteration of this for loop, you have to do a full run of this one right here. So you're doing this one for the amount of times that this runs. And so what you the, the a way you can express this in terms of how long it takes is called big O notation. So it looks like this: big O, and you go n, and then the essentially complexity of this. So complexity is just how much nesting you sort of have going on. When you have this attention going on, the more you increase it, uh, it, it sort of scales exponentially in a way. So in this particular example, in the nested for loop example you get big O of n squared. Attention as well is big O of n squared. And so there is a way to drastically reduce the amount of multiplies or comparisons you have going on. So long story short, Mamba does not actually use attention. It uses a completely different way of keeping track of this sort of uh, time series uh, interactions that are happening. And so uses what's called a structured state space or structured state spaces or SSMs in shorthand. So an SSM, I'll actually just draw it over here in blue marker. So an SSM 
SSMs you can think of as just a the, the actual state space itself is like a matrix. So you have like a value here, a one, a two, up to a sub n. And so there's a bunch of these values, and these are it sort of represents the state of the actual sort of time series token length that's happening. So you have all these tokens that are spread out. And this is used to understand uh, how, sort of how does the state change? How does the context change over time? So what we can do is if we have, say, a, a list of tokens, we can go H E L L O. This is one, two, three, four, five. So what will happen is when we have H, the state will be in some arbitrary state, doesn't, doesn't really uh, matter what it is. But the point is, uh, when it sees an H, it'll think, oh, we have to update the context because we just saw an H in comparison to, you know, everything before it or everything that it's seen already. And so this will make an update to the state, uh, state space, meaning this, these values will change a little bit. And then when it sees an E, that will also make a slight change to the state space because as it has seen, we just got an E and the previous state was representative of an H and everything else that we saw, which was like nothing really, but it saw an E given that we just saw an H. And so now it has context that we saw an E and an H. Now, when it looks at the L, it's gonna say, okay, well, we just, we just saw an L and now we have to you know, consider what the next token generated is gonna be given the fact that we've seen you know this this l the previous e and the previous h right so the state will change over time this giant vector space of states will change over time and this is actually sort of linear in a way it's actually big o of n so it doesn't have this square up here meaning it's a lot more efficient and i'm going to link the paper in the description but you can actually look at it and it performs a, a lot better than a lot of classical transformers on a lot of benchmarks. So this is quite promising. And, you know, state uh, structured state spaces are used in a bunch of different places in computer science, it's especially machine learning. You have this, this, uh, this sort of like giant vector space and you're making adjustments to it over time. But this happened to work particularly well for language modeling. So that's that. Uh, if this doesn't make sense, feel free to, you know, join my Discord server, ask questions. Um, but I'm going to move on to flash attention now, which is the next algorithmic breakthrough. So to make this clear, uh, some of you have probably heard of flash attention already. Uh, there's actually two versions of flash attention. So there's just regular flash attention, flash attention, and then there's flash attention two, which came out in 2023. So I'm going to be mostly referring to that one. Uh, but the still the fundamental concept of flash attention did originate in the original paper for it back in uh, 2022. So to start off, this actually requires a slight amount of hardware knowledge. And if you don't, that's still fine because I'm going to explain this. But uh, flash attention sort of exploits hardware. That's the best way to think of this. And it uses a specific algorithm uh, in the context of hardware to help accelerate the token inference process. So flash attention uses VRAM in your GPU. This is assuming that you're running the model on your GPU, which you probably should be. Uh, it utilizes VRAM and SRAM. So VRAM is a little bit slower. VRAM is a little bit slower and there's a lot more of it. So if you, if you look at your GPU specs, if you have an NVIDIA RTX 3070 like I do, you might have eight gigabytes of VRAM or video RAM. And this is the slower type. This is the one that you would load the model parameters into, uh, keep track of gradients, do your back, back propagation, etc. So this is a little bit slower. It's still wickedly fast compared to the just the regular system RAM that you have, but it is slower in comparison to SRAM. And to be clear, SRAM has a very fast computational and sort of memory bandwidth, meaning I think it in, some of the top tier NVIDIA chips, SRAM actually goes up to uh, around 19 terabytes per second. 
which is really fast, right? Um, most people have like maybe 500 gigabytes to one terabyte of total storage on their computer. Uh, this does computations and has a memory bandwidth of 19 terabytes per second. That is just crazy. So GPT-3 does not actually use SRAM. It just uses VRAM. It does that attention mechanism, like I explained earlier, and like you'll see in uh, my free code camp course, if you decide to take it, is that uh, all of this self-attention is done on VRAM in GPT-3. And so when you utilize the SRAM for certain computations and you sort of schedule operations to happen when you want them to, I know this is a mouthful, it'll make sense in a second, uh, you can accelerate the token inference process a lot. So this uses a technique called tiling. And what I'm going to do is just draw a grid to help this make sense. So if we have the word, uh, hello, and we, we sort of model this in a, in a, in a self-attention format, it'll look like this. The H E L L O and then H E L L O. And so you get this, it's called an attention matrix. And it shows you how much each token is interacting with each other token. So it's this grid you can think of it as. And so what we can do is instead of doing all these sort of attention computations like H to H, H to E, H to L, E to L, etc. Instead of doing this all on VRAM, you can select little parts of it. You can select little parts or tiles of it. If you say you want to do this one right here, these four squares, you would take these you would shove them into your SRAM to get computed a lot quicker. And then whilst this is being uh, thrown into your SRAM, you could say, okay, well, what's the next one we have to compute? And then maybe you want to take this one right here and then also begin sending it into your SRAM. So this is obviously a very complicated process if you couldn't tell already, but this is the basic premise of it. You want to take these little tiles or boxes that are necessary to do computations on. You want to do all that you possibly can with that data and nothing less, essentially, because you want to be using it to the fullest extent. It's only available in SRAM for so long. So you want to exploit as much as you can, meaning get as much computations as you can out of it while it's in SRAM. And so while you have all these chunks loading in, you want to keep on sending a new one every time you, you start sent, like when you send the first one, right away, you want to send the second one, because by the time this one gets to here, the first one's already going to be done, because SRAM is just that fast. So you want to keep sending these tiles into SRAM and just getting your sort of attention matrix computed like almost instantly, it's like so quick. Uh, reportedly, somewhere between a three and 10x speed up, as, as compared to regular uh, VRAM self attention. So that's how flash attention works. And flash attention two in particular, is really special because uh, it optimizes some of the hyperparameters, coefficients, whatever. Uh, I'm not an expert in how flash attention uh, works on a super low level and all the optimizations that, that goes on. But what I do know is that flash attention two is just a more optimized version of regular flash attention. So the authors, uh, they just optimize the crap out of flash attention and produce another version of it. And that happens to actually utilize a crazy astonishing number. I believe it was around 72% of the GPU. So only 100% can be used. They used 72% by using flash attention too. And that is quite hard to do. Like right now, or if you're, if you're re rendering or if you're say, uh, getting inference or training the language model from my course, you might be using like 10 to 20% of your GPU's maximum capacity or all the cores or, or just efficiency overall. Um, 72 is pretty good. Uh, so given that, we're going to jump into the next topic or the next sort of criteria, which is uh, which agent performed the best, which agent system, uh, all the infrastructure behind that, I don't know about you. My first time as a child uh, coming in, sort of into contact with this AI stuff, 
and machine learning and just seeing this whole new world of like what is an intelligent machine what quite is it my first interaction was actually seeing this stuff in video games right so whether it's playing pong or watching it play minecraft or maybe some other like wii sport or or, or whatever it is N name your video game right uh, these are pretty cool and these are actually the most sort of long-term advancements that we're going to have as a human species because when we get agents we can make them go do other really complex tasks that maybe some other humans can't or it's too dangerous to do so so things like going out and doing emergency based tasks like firefighting or if you even wanted to stretch it out a couple hundred years you could go or you could go asteroid mining or uh, colonizing planets for us and setting up you know setting up base type of thing so agents are like really cool and the point is is they should be uh, I, I want to shine some light on them because even though they are really celebrated it's really good to really see where this could go and I think the best uh, breakthrough that represents a you know so, sort of shining shining light on uh, agents in our environments is Voyager <laughs> So it's like, get to the point, right? Uh, yeah, Voyager is the first one. Voyager is pretty much an AI that learns to play Minecraft. And it's, it's just in its own 3D environment. And it learns by actually querying language models like GPT-4 and just asking how to do things and mapping out the whole exploration process and whatnot. And that is like super cool because... Uh, well, it's not quite an architectural thing, like it's sort of architectural, but the idea of an agent is to be in this uh, reinforcement learning environment where you get like these custom rewards that are defined by the physics and the rules of the game. And Voyager is a really good representation of that. And Voyager, of course, cannot be... Uh, Voyager can't be celebrated without also celebrating Mind Dojo. And Mind Dojo is another paper that is kind of also a complementary breakthrough to it. They're kind of like in the same group. So I was unsure as to whether to include this as one or two. So I decided to include it as one breakthrough. Uh, hopefully that doesn't make anyone annoyed or anything, but uh, Voyager is the actual AI that learns how to play in the game. It learns over time. And then Mind Dojo is the actual code infrastructure that allows Voyager to do such neat things in the Minecraft environment. So you can actually test Mind Dojo locally. I might make a video on using Mind Dojo soon, but there's tons of documentation out on it already. Uh, it's fairly easy to set up. And yeah, so the two key points here are the actual infrastructure to have these agents working in a complex environment, meaning like the function calling APIs, libraries, uh, and the actual uh, intelligent agent itself, which is Voyager. So uh, hopefully you like my little presentation on agents. Now let's move on to the next breakthrough in quantization. So the next breakthrough, and I think this one's going to be fairly easy for you guys to understand, is in quantization. It is called QLORA. So to spell this out for you guys, I'm just going to write this out here. So it is spelled like this, Q L. it's lowercase o and then an R. So what does this stand for? This is an interesting set of characters we have here. So Q means uh, quantized, quantizated. Yeah, I can't spell. Uh, don't look at that. It's quantized. The LO is for low rank. Um, or the LOR, so it's a low, and then rank, and then A is for adaptation. Adaptation. I'm still getting practice writing on this thing, so bear with me for now. Uh, so Kilora is quantized low-ranked adaptation. So the first part that I think is important to cover is this quantization part, the quantized. How does it get quantized? So quantization, like I said before, is like flipping uh, by a floating point 32 number to a floating point 16 or even furthermore to a floating point 4. So a floating point 32 will have you know a bunch of bits right there'll be a bunch of different like switches that you can have on and off 
And so the first one will be a negative. No, well, it'll, it, or rather, instead of a negative, it'll be the sign. So it'll be, you know, positive or negative. Meaning, if it's positive, it'll be a zero. And if it's a one, it'll be a negative. And then you have a bunch of other bits. And these are the exponents. So this is like the coefficient before the decimal place, right? This is the exponent here. And then afterwards, you have the decimal point precision. So 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, etc. Uh, that's your decimal point precision. So you have one bit here, usually like eight bits here. And then you'll have, uh, I believe, 23 at the end. So you have 23 plus 1 gives you 24. And then you add 8 and you get 32. So this is just from NVIDIA's documentation, reading what a floating point 32 works, how, how a floating point 32 works. And that's, that's sort of what this looks like in a hardware level. And with a floating point 32, you get around 19 decimal places or something. If you really optimize, you get 19 decimal places. And that's like quite a lot. Uh, mostly in ML, you don't actually need 19 decimal places. That is like kind of ridiculous. So you can dumb it down to a floating point 16 and you'll get, you know, maybe like 10 or so decimal places, a little like about half, but that's still pretty good. You know, 10 decimal places is still wonderful. And then you say, well, Elliot, why the heck would you reduce it to four? Because if you do two to the four, this is equal to 16. Uh, two to the one is two, two to the two is four. 2 to the 3 is 8, right? So 2 to the 4 is 16. You can only have 16 values in here. So how the heck does that work, you ask? Well, in this particular type, in the in the context of the QLORA paper, what they did is instead of using, uh, instead of using uh, floating point for decimal precision, meaning, you know, have like a, have like a sign bit, so having like a sign bit, and then, you know, like an exponent, and then decimal one, decimal two, that's ridiculous. What you can do instead is have 16 different numbers to index. So you can have this array of numbers. So like, do like E1, E2, E3, all the way up to E16. And what you can do is you can index these numbers. So they'll, they'll be a fix, it'll be a fixed array or list of floating point numbers. And all this does is it allows you to index. So I can say, you know, uh, it's called normal float, I believe is the correct term for it. So NF4, normal float four. And if I like use an array indice on this and I go like seven, well, what this is gonna do is it's gonna look at the it's going to look at the seven in, seventh index and see, well, what is this number in a more sort of spread out form? What does this look like in floating point 16, right? So that's all this does is it represents all of your weights and biases in a floating point four or normal float four format. And it just indexes this fixed array of uh, more precise numbers. And so that's how these, uh, this quantization part works. And that is pretty cool. So if you understand that, give yourself a pat on the back. It's pretty, it's a little hard at first, but uh, it shouldn't be too bad. And then this last one, um, LoRa. So low rank adaptation. Well, what does this do? This is actually my favorite part. And I don't quite understand it fully uh, because it's just utterly amazing. But imagine you have this giant model, okay? You have this giant model say, I don't know, GPT-3, the giant model, and you want to try, you want to fine tune this model locally. So you want to have a batch size, you want to be able to do this in parallel, really fast. But you can't do that because you don't have, uh, you don't have a, a cluster of H100s in your basement. So what do you do instead? Well, you create this smaller weight matrix you know, with maybe a few million or a few billion values. And instead of training this, what you do is you fine tune this specific matrix. And then later 
once you fine tune these values, and by the way, you, you keep track of these. PyTorch uses, um, PyTorch will use these values and potentially these ones as your gradients. So uh, the backward pass still happens to work. And so once you're done fine tuning, you're just updating this matrix and you just add it to here every time to uh, get your actual token uh, prediction. And so all you do is you simply just have an intelligent way of integrating this one with this one. So whether that's adding, I mean, the matrix structure might throw it off because you have a matrix that's like, you know, one sort of uh, tensor, uh, tensor shape and then another that's a completely different tensor shape. And so you have to figure out a way to integrate them together. But once you can do that, you can actually integrate this small matrix with the, with the much bigger white matrix GPT-3. And so that's how you can fine tune a model that is much bigger than what you'd normally be able to store. So you use this idea of having a smaller white matrix and then you fine tune this one and you add it later or you integrate it into the larger model. And then the second part is using normal float four. So four bit quantization instead of 32. So you've just decreased your precision by a factor of eight and you're also having this very small small white matrix so you can actually fine tune extremely large models locally if you do this right so i think that the the whole idea of that being a breakthrough explains itself because it actually touches on two really important points in efficient memory usage altogether and just finding ways of you know exploiting the precision of numbers so uh hopefully you found that interesting there's a bunch of examples of people doing this on hugging face. So you can look at like PEFT or PEFT uh, fine tuning or QLORA fine tuning and get examples of this and build intuition. Paper will be in the description. And then last but not least, uh, alignment papers. So I don't think it makes sense to leave alignment out at all. Alignment is an extremely important subject for keeping AI safe on earth. Because uh, at some point, you know, we're, we're going to be able to go to other planets and we just want to make sure that this AI is safe for us to use, right? We want to make sure it does not go off on a tangent. There are lots of people who criticize like the potential uh, catastrophic risk of AI. And so I believe this is there, uh, maybe not to the same extent that they do, but uh, regardless, alignment is still important because it helps us understand what exactly our model is thinking. Whether it's trying to understand if your model is dangerous or just understanding if your model is going to give inaccurate results when you want it to give you accurate ones. It, it's just really important in general. And there's a specific subfield of alignment that isn't philosophical at all. It's actually called mechanistic interpretability. For those of you who haven't heard about mechanistic interpretability, it is not actually very new. This has been around since, I don't know, the 2010s. It's been around for like a very long time. And I just wanted to highlight on sort of the most major, most significant breakthroughs that happened this year. So that would mean uh, it's actually not any papers in particular. I found uh, actually two infrastructural projects that I felt were the most uh, breakthrough based because at the end of the day, if you really think about it, a lot of these ideas, like a lot of people could come up with them. Maybe not everyone, but a lot of people can invent like a new neural network architecture. They can, you know, think of maybe a new algorithm, but nothing actually gets more to the point than proper uh, hardware and software infrastructure. So you wouldn't be able to code as fast without something like Visual Studio Code or Vim or Emacs, whatever text editor you use, right? Those are examples of infrastructure. And so I felt the greatest winners here were XAI's Prompt EDE and Eleuther AI's uh, Alignment Mind Test. So let's start off with the more less mouthful of words example, uh, XAI's prompt IDE. So there's a little snapshot on the screen. You just take a look at this. This is essentially what the text editor looks like. You can look at uh, to like how tokens were sampled, what the probability was for them, and then actually look more into your network and see which neurons were firing off to give those signals to make it say those things, which is like insanely cool to think about. Right, you can you trace back all the way to this neuron and say, oh, this is the evil neuron. This is the one that wants to kill people, but all the other ones are good, <laughs> right? So that's just something super cool 
And when you have infrastructure and software like Prompt IDE, you can develop and test uh, interpretability ideas way faster because it allows you to see into the network and have a way to prompt engineer and test these language models, etc. Um, and then the next one is sort of the same idea. Uh, it's a it's an interpretability tool called MindTest. So this is actually built by a Luther AI. Luther AI is a it quite literally says in their website. It's like a let me search it up. A Luther AI. Uh, nonprofit research lab focused on interpretability, alignment, and ethics of artificial intelligence. So they're all about interpretability, essentially alignment. Uh, and so it, it's kind of expected that you'd see something like this from a Luther. And that's why I can't really leave them out because they, I mean, I'm in their community. Uh, they have a lot of good stuff. They're always publishing great research. Uh, people there are super nice. And yeah, those are, those are the two alignment tools I feel like are the most important right now doesn't have to be some super breakthrough level idea because there's constantly new ideas coming about everything. It's so hard to keep track of it and boil it down to just a few for the entirety of 2023. So I feel like the best breakthroughs are the infrastructural ones. And before I bring up honorable mentions, it's probably a good idea to explain how the idea of mechanistic interpretability sort of came to be. So if I illustrate this on the board here, I'll use I'll use this. There's my blue one. Okay. So, M E C H mechan mechanistic inter press on bill ability. Okay. So when you think of mechanistic. Some words that might come to mind are mechanical, right? What does mechanical refer to? The inner workings of a system. So you, you would probably agree that another word for mechanical would be maybe the inner workings of something, right? If you're talking about the mechanics of your car, the inner workings of your car, right? They're, they're pretty much the same thing. And so what mechanistic refers to in this case is just the inner workings uh, of interpretability, inner workings of AI brains or, or language models or, or systems, whatever, whatever you pick your word, right? Uh, the point is, is the inner workings of them. And then the second word, interpretability, is also had a, has a lot of syllables. But when you interpret something, you're sort of like reading it, you're, you're taking it in, right? You're interpreting it um, relative to a bunch of other things. So it's sort of the inner workings of how you interpret something or interpreting the inner workings of a model. This is what mechanistic, mechanistic interpretability refers to. So you're looking at the inner workings of a system and you're interpreting them. So if you have a, uh, a network, like three neurons, maybe two, or three, and then maybe one neuron here, these ones are all gonna like fire into each other and then maybe this neuron in the end says, you know, it, it samples the word kill. Well, what if we didn't have the word kill in its training data? What if it just made that up and it's evil or something? Then what we can do is look at, okay, well, what caused, which neurons caused the probability of the token kill to be really high? What caused this, what caused the model to sample this word out of any other words? And then you look and... Maybe you find out that, you know, this neuron had a key role and then it ended up being this neuron down here. So this is, maybe that's the bad guy. Maybe that neuron is thinking something you don't want it to, or it has some, uh, it has some, <laughs> it has some numbers that are influencing the probability of the word kill coming up. Uh, and so this is pretty much what it refers to. And a Luther, uh, a bunch of organizations are developing tools to help look into this, uh, but the ones that stand out to me the most right away are XAI's development in Prompt IDE and a Luther AI's development in MindTest because MindTest is a more advanced environment and when you're when your agent is you know trying to learn more complex things, it helps to have this non-black box approach to seeing uh, how that network is actually understanding this complex 3D environment. So uh, 
hopefully that helps clarify the whole mechanistic interpretability uh, set of words. Uh, and now for the honorable mentions. So you guys are probably like, Elliot, why the heck didn't you mention mixture of experts, right? This is the thing that Mixtral 8x7b is running on, as well as uh, allegedly GPT-4 uh, relies on the mixture of experts architecture heavily. So maybe I should just explain mixture of experts to help clarify that for you guys. Mixture of experts is when you have a bunch of smaller models, so maybe a bunch of uh, fine-tuned llama models, little 7 billion parameter models on specific topics. So one maybe knows a lot about physics, and then this one knows a lot about liberal arts, and then this one knows a lot about chemistry. And so you wanna figure out the meaning of life using physics, chemistry, and liberal arts. And so what'll happen is all of these different experts, because you're fine tuning them to be experts on the subject, you would combine them together and you would get a more nuanced or more well-rounded output because it's not just one model generalizing over a large data set of experts, it's, cert it's rather certain models uh, getting ex explicitly fine-tuned on very hard topics. And so it's, it turns out that it's a lot easier for smaller models to master a topic than it is for a big model to master many topics. And so this is the whole idea of Mixtral. Uh, you can actually run it on your computer. If you have 64 gigabytes of RAM, uh, a lot of people don't, but you could always run it on a cloud instance and figure out that way. But uh, you can get a Mixtral 8x7b model, uh, almost the performance of GPT-4, running locally and uncensored. So it can actually, you know, I, I actually got it to tell me, uh, you know, how to do bad things. <laughs> I'm not going to explicitly say what I asked it because YouTube would probably take the video down, but just to kind of test it and see, you know, what are the limits of this thing. So. Uh, it tells you how to build weapons, etc., and it's just good to, I think, you know, release this and really see uh, what are, what is the potential harm of releasing these models into the public, right? Because they're not to the point where everyone's going to start building, you know, weapons of mass destruction and then kill all humans. Uh, well, I mean, as at least it hasn't happened yet. Who knows? But the point is, releasing these models sort of helps test safety and uh, see what society thinks and what people are doing with them and just getting getting more data uh, about the ideas people have. So I'm not going to run my mouth anymore. The the last the, really the last point I want to cover, but no papers really stood out to me is uh, data science and uh, scalability of data. So right now we're kind of more or less in a data crisis where there's lots of brilliant ideas where we could, you know, apply this, you know, uh, machine learning concept or this specific architecture to like brain waves maybe but the thing is is there's just not like millions of images or uh, signals of brain waves we just don't have that data yet so uh, one of the one of the things i hope to see in 2024 is seeing what data scalability breakthroughs we can come to so uh, one of them is like you know the labeler the the, the concept of the labeler where you train a labeler model on a very small set of data, like for example, watching Minecraft videos. So if it's trying to learn how to uh, label these videos based off what it sees, you could train it on maybe, you know, a few hours of gameplay of you just doing very generic things, going into caves, uh, traversing the overworld, etc. And you could later, uh, after training a little bit, you could get it to look at maybe a hundred thousand hours of Minecraft and label them in, you know, maybe a day or two instead of hand labeling it every single frame, right? So that just this idea of data scalability and uh, trying to build off and maybe edit or reinvent the whole labeler thing, I think is really important. And I really hope we see uh, something like this in 2024 because it seriously would help the open source community a ton. We'd be able to build tons of great things. And uh, it's just a good point to highlight. So if you enjoyed the material covered here, uh, feel free to like and subscribe. You can always subscribe at any time. Um, I explain coding concepts and I just nerd out to science topics in my Discord server. So you can feel free to join there. Just the link in the description down below. Uh, join my Discord there. Um, and lastly, if you're looking for a tutor or a consultant for your ML projects or a company, um, or even just customize coding lessons for you or like one-on-one -on -one tutoring sessions, uh, integrating AI with your business, you like you name it. 
um, totally feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn, Twitter, or simply get in touch with me through my Discord server. Uh, my Fiverr profile is in the description below, so you can, uh, you know, talk me through there as well. I usually do around 20 to 30 minutes a free consultation or tutoring just to, you know, give you an idea about what you should expect. The point is to help people build intuitions so that they don't have to rely on a teacher. And so that's the whole point of what I do. So all the links that you've seen or all the links of the papers you've seen are in the description. And that's all I got. See you in the next video. Bye.